connecting to the server and we are now live. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a little bit sad today in some ways because uh, we're actually coming to the uh, official end of this new series of seminars that uh, Trento and I have uh, put together. Uh, Simone is here as well, actually. Um, I don't know if you want to say something on behalf of Trento as well on, on the kind of closing uh, talk, just a word of hello and uh, from the Trento side. Yes, so from the Trento side, it's not quite the last seminar. We have, I think, a couple of more seminars, so stay tuned uh, for the announcements. Uh, but it was great. It was really a great seminar series. So thank you so much for everybody for participating and Adrian, of course, for uh, co-hosting and getting this started. Okay, so um, uh, with no further ado, this week's speaker, uh, we're certainly uh, going out with a, a huge firework display because we're uh, really uh, very pleased to announce we have uh, Professor Sandrine Boni uh, from LMD. She's a director of research uh, in uh, LMD in Paris. And I was actually looking before the, the talk at the, uh, the, the awards and medals. She's been heavily involved in the uh, IPCC process in the past. Uh, she has uh, an amazing array of experiences in terms of we've seen in various conferences, pictures of her flying micro lights, taking measurements <laughs> in clouds in the boundary layer. She organizes uh, international observation campaigns. She is involved in huge modeling studies and model developments. I remember back in my PhD days, reading with awe some of the parameterization developments she was uh, writing and authoring for the LMD model in terms of cloud parameterization. It certainly uh, influenced a lot of my own work uh, in, in the area. And so, of course, she's got a rich ar ar array of awards, uh, such as the Bernard Howitz Memorial Award from the AMS, I see. Uh, she has also recently been awarded the silver medal of the CNRS. So today we're going to hear actually about some of this observational work that's been going on recently. And again, not only is it amazing to organize a massive observation campaign, but to do it in the middle of a pandemic. I really uh, am amazed at how you managed to uh, bring this to a conclusion. So before I eat up all your time, I'm gonna pass over to Sandrine and say thank you so much for joining us to, to give this uh, last uh, seminar in the series. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Adrian, for this nice introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, I'm sure it would be more fun to be all together in the same room, but the good side of uh, the Zoom meeting is that we can be different places together at the same time. So there are, there are also some advantages. Um, so I am going to try to share my screen. Um, Let's see if it works. Uh, is it? Tuck. No, not this one. No, it's not the right one. Okay. Um, okay. Let me try something else. Sorry. <laughs> um, Okay. Does it work? Can you see my screen? It's perfect. Yeah, great. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, I, I'm I'm very glad to to be able to share with you some of my excitement for a topic that I find really interesting, and I hope that you will be convinced that it's uh, very interesting at the end of this talk. Um, it's about the mesoscale organization of clouds in the trade wind regions. You all probably know that uh, the organization of convection is. Uh, has raised a lot of interest over the years in the community and Adri and is one of the responsible uh, for that, <laughs> one of the people who, who raised a lot of interest for this uh, some time ago. And many people are interested in the organization of deep convection, but uh, the uh, shallow convection also can organize in different ways. And it's at least as interesting as the uh, organization of deep convection, I would say. And uh, so I'd like to talk about the mesoscale organization of clouds in a particular type of regime, which is the regime of the trade winds. 
And this type of, of uh, organization has not been studied very much so far, but it's in the trade wind region that we organized uh, the Eureka Field campaign last year, as, as uh, Adrian said. And it was not during the pandemic, but right before the pandemic, because the, the campaign finished uh, in February 2020, so just before the, the, the start of the pandemic. And so as part of the preparation of this uh, campaign, we, we looked a lot at satellite imagery because we wanted to know how the, what kind of uh, situations we could find in the campaign. And that's how we got really interested in this issue of the mesoscale organization of clouds in these regions. So I will tell you what we've learned during the preparation of the campaign on this subject. And also what uh, we've started to learn from the campaign itself. And obviously it's just uh, preliminary uh, findings uh, because the data processing of, of the campaign uh, is still ongoing. So it's, it's very preliminary stuff, but uh, I hope it will uh, at least raise some interest uh, for the campaign. Uh, so I'd like to mention first that the work I'm going to present obviously has been done in collaboration with many people. Uh, mostly from my group, but also from people in, in Germany, and uh, particularly with Bjorn, with whom I, uh, we have organized the campaign together, and uh, many young scientists. So when we think of the organization of shallow convection, uh, most of the time we, we think of particular types of, of organizations, and one type which, uh, which comes to mind is this, uh, cloud streets or rolls, which have been uh, studied uh, for a long time, that we can find uh, over the high latitude of oceans, but we can also see this type of uh, organization over land sometimes. Another type of organization which has been studied a lot in the past is this type of uh, mesoscale, mesoscale cellular convective systems. Uh, so I'm going to remove this. What can I do? Yeah. Um, so the, the, this uh, type of systems can be really spectacular if you look at them in satellite imagery. And you can, in this picture, recognize what we call usually uh, closed cells or open cells, depending on whether the clouds are surrounded by a clear sky or whether it's uh, a clear sky which is surrounded by clouds. So it depends on the proportion of clear sky and cloudy uh, uh, areas. And uh, you, you saw the open cells and closed cells are often found uh, close to each other. Sometimes you have uh, open cells in the middle of closed cells, as you can see here. Well, so it's a really nice type of organization. And there have been many studies already uh, on this uh, topic in the past. Um, but uh, and, and, and in particular, so in this uh, particular study by uh, Mulbauer, um, they, they try to, to recognize these patterns automatically by using a neural network so that they could screen at many satellite images and recognize this type of patterns of closed cells or open cells. And then they could make a climatology of these patterns. And what they showed is that the closed cells can be found mostly at, over the mid latitude oceans, but also at the eastern side of the ocean basins here, so where the ocean is, is not too warm. The open cells are less frequent than the closed cells, but they can be found or well, they have a little bit more widespread, as you can see. But what I find really interesting in this study is that actually they, they show that over most of the tropical ocean, and in particular in the subtropics where it's red, we can't find this type of patterns. So this type of, of organizations are very spectacular, but they are not representative at all of what's going on in most of most of the tropical oceans. And in this study, the type of organizations that they find in those regions, the, the name naming disorganized MCCs, uh, so disorganized organization, if you like, because it does not correspond to the classical uh, pattern of closed cells or open cells that, that has been found elsewhere. So the, the Eureka Fig campaign that we wanted to organize uh, was going to take place in this area here of the Western Tropical Atlantic, close to Barbados. So right in the middle of a red spot. <laughs> so we, we wondered what kind, what kind of organization we could find there. And so in, 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 as part of the preparation of the campaign, 
we decided to look at it in more details. And so what we did is that with a, a few colleagues, we sat in a, in a room for several days, looking at satellite images uh, on a big screen for several days and, and trying to, to detect some prominent patterns of organization. And we found that the organization in this area, so this is Barbados here, this is the Caribbean islands. In this area, the, the mesoscale organization can be very variable from one day to the next. Uh, for instance, here you have a day during which uh, clouds organize along uh, lines or arcs, uh, like here, which are reminiscent of cold pools. But on, on a, a few days later, on, an, on another day, you can find this, this kind of organization. Where here, it's completely different. You can, uh, it's still shallow convection and the cloud tops are around 2.5 or three kilometers. But as you can see here, for instance, uh, we have clouds that are much more extensive. And in particular, we, there is some uh, uh, stratiform anvil at the top of the cloud, which can be uh, several hundred kilometers large, separated by very clear sky uh, situations. So by looking at many uh, images, several hundred, um, we pointed out the fact that um, there were four prominent patterns of, of cloudiness that we could find in this region. And we, named, we gave names to these patterns because it's much easier to, to talk about them once you have a name to talk about them. So the first type of, of organization, um, we named it sugar because it really looks like sugar powdered over the ocean. And it's, uh, it's associated with very shallow clouds, very small clouds that you can hardly see from, from satellites. The, another type of organization, we named it gravel because of the structure, the texture of the, of, uh, of the image. And it's uh, associated with shallow clouds, but also some deeper clouds. And another type of organization, we named it fish because it looks like the skeleton of a fish. It's uh, composed of uh, large clusters of cloudiness uh, with some uh, smaller scale structures within it. And the last uh, type of organization, we named it flowers because it, why it corresponds to the, the type of organization we were looking at earlier. And that is, uh, it's really a beautiful one with associated with us, uh, cloud systems with a stratiform and gear. So we can look at this. Uh, so this is, yeah, I should have said that, but the, uh, each image here is, is a, a domain of about 1000 kilometers by 1000 kilometers. So we can look at this patterns from space and we can also look at um, the clouds that compose these patterns by looking at uh, ground-based observations. In particular, we used the radar um, that, uh, that was installed in the Barbados Cloud Observatory to look at the cloud types that were found within those patterns. And by doing this, we, we found that the, the different patterns are associated with different cloud types. This sugar type of organization, as I said earlier, is really associated with those very, very shallow and thin clouds that hardly exceed the level of conversation. This gravel type of, of organization is associated also with the presence of these very shallow clouds, but also with deeper clouds that can go up to three or four kilometers and that can uh, rain heavily sometimes. And, and those two types of organization are associated with more exten extensive cloudiness, especially uh, near the inversion level. And this one, as you can see here, very clearly is associated with, with a, an anvil, a very thin uh, layer of uh, stratiform cloudiness. So those patterns first were identified visually, so it was really subjective. Um, and, uh, but afterwards, of course, we wondered whether it could be possible to recognize these different patterns in a more automatic way. And there are different ways uh, to do that. Um, so there, there were some initiatives to, uh, to do it through machine learning. And if you want to, to do it through machine learning, you need a training data set. 
So what uh, Stefan Rasp uh, told did is that they developed a crowdsourcing platform so that many people could uh, contribute and, and look at different satellite images, classify the patterns, and, and then we have a, a huge specification data set that can be used as a training data set for deep learning algorithms. And there are different techniques of machine learning that can be used now to, to recognize these patterns. And in parallel, we wondered whether it was possible to recognize these different patterns uh, without machine learning, but just using a simple methodology to analyze the, the satellite images. And uh, that's what I am going to tell you a few words about it, because we are going to use it for, for the next uh, few things that I will show you. So here, we used geostationary satellite observations in the infrared for 20 years, and we tried to characterize the spatial organization of the clouds by using two different metrics. Uh, one metric is the mean uh, size of the cloud objects, the cloud clusters that we can detect. And uh, the other metric is the so-called IORG organization index that was proposed by Adrian a few years ago with Adisu Semi. And that characterizes um, the distance in between clouds. So it's based on the, on the PDF of the uh, distance uh, between the nearest neighbors uh, clouds. So we, we did that and we, so it, we took many days uh, in, in, in winter. And for each day, we, we associated one point in this 2D space uh, with a, associated with those two metrics. So we have a big cloud of points, and we try to differentiate four uh, extreme cases of, of organization. So the, we try to, to separate the most contrasted uh, types of organization by considering the first and third tercels of each metric. So that effectively defines four quad quadrants that we can name A, B, C, D, right? And then we try to see whether there was some relationship between these different quadrants and the, the four prominent patterns of organization that we had found uh, visually. And that's uh, what uh, we show here. We found that this, uh, this quadrant, for instance, was largely associated with the flowers uh, situations that we had identified visually. And this uh, quadrant here was associated mostly with sugar type of situations. And the two other quadrants were a little bit more ambiguous, ambiguous, but uh, at first order, they were associated with a predominance of fish or, or gravel type of situations. So then we renamed this four quadrants as flowers, fish, gravel, and sugar. And use this simple method to, to recognize uh, the, the, the patterns from satellite observations. And then we wanted to see whether there, were, there was some relationship between the cloud patterns and the environmental conditions in which they occur. So we consider different uh, environmental properties or variables, like the SST, the lower tropospheric stability, the wind speed, the wind shear, et cetera, et cetera. And among these different uh, variables, we found two of them that turned out to be most discriminating for the cloud patterns which are the, uh, the surface wind speed and the lower tropospheric stability. So typically we found that, so this is a lower tropospheric stability or the strength of the inversion, the level of the trade inversion. This is a surface wind speed. We found, for instance, that the flower type of organizations were found mostly when the situation was uh, very windy and very stable while the gravel type of organization was also found when the, the surface wind speed was strong, but the atmosphere was less uh, stable, for instance. So we looked at this uh, by, based on 20 years of data, but we could uh, look at it also for individual seasons for several years. And what you can see here is that uh, depending on the year, we had a predominance of one type of, of pattern or another type. For instance, during this uh, winter season, we had mostly uh, fish patterns, and it was uh, consistent with the fact that um, during this year, this season, we had a lot of uh, stable situations and low wind speeds. While on this uh, other season, for instance, we had a predominance of uh, 
of uh, windy situations and we had mostly uh, gravel and flowers depending on the stability and so on. So the, the association between the environmental conditions and the type of patterns in prisons was, uh, appeared to be quite robust. Also more recently, uh, Jessica Vial uh, et al. looked at diurnal variations in, in the patterns. And they did this by uh, uh, identifying the patterns through machine learning and applying their, their, their methodology to the GOES-16 uh, satellite observations. And they showed that there is also a diurnal modulation of the frequency of the different patterns. And when looking at, at the surface wind speed and, and the stability, they also find that there is, um, whereas different cloud patterns are stratified by the wind speed and the stability during all the day and not just at one particular time of the day. And they found that the diurnal variations were more associated with uh, the wind variations during the day than with the stability variations. Then the question is whether the different patterns have different radiative impacts. So we looked at this uh, by using uh, the methodology I was uh, discussing earlier to recognize the patterns. And we looked at the net uh, cloud relative effects of this pattern. So the cloud relative effect is the impact of clouds on, on the, the Earth's radiation budget at the top of the atmosphere. <clears throat> and we looked at this as a function of the low cloud cover associated with each of those patterns. And of course, when the cloud cover is, is larger, the clouds have a stronger cooling effect than when the cloud cover is smaller. And what we find, what we see on this figure here, is that at first order, um, if the different patterns have different relative effects, and indeed between this uh, pattern and this pattern, there is a factor of three, roughly, of difference. At first order, we can interpret this difference mostly as a the consequence of the fact that these different patterns are associated with different low cloud covers. Whether for a given low cloud cover, there is also um, a systematic difference in the radiative impact between the different patterns. It could be associated with the differences in microphysical properties, for instance. I would say that from this data set, it's not obvious. It's, uh, it's not significant, uh, at least. But at first order, it's really the macroscopic differences between those different patterns that explain the, the fact that they exert different radiative impacts. So then we can wonder what are the implications of this for, for the cloud feedbacks. When we want to understand cloud feedbacks, um, especially the low cloud feedbacks, what we want to do is to, um, to understand what are the, the, the environmental factors, uh, how the environmental factors affect the cloud properties, right? Um, and the radiative properties in particular. And we do this by considering different environmental conditions. And potentially we can consider different uh, cloud types when, when, when we try to relate the environment to the cloud properties. And usually we differentiate the cloud types from the vertical structure only. But what we've seen here is that there is also a link between the environment and the mesoscale organization and between the mesoscale organization and the cloud properties. So that we can wonder if to understand this link between the environment and the cloud properties, the relative properties in particular, whether we need to consider the role of the mesoscale organization. This is an open issue. And clearly at the moment, I would say that we don't really know whether or not it's important to consider this route to understand this. But that's, a, that's a, a, an interesting issue at least. So we'd like the, the models to tell us something about this and to tell us whether the mesoscale organization of clouds matters for cloud feedbacks. But we don't have the answer yet for this question. Um, first of all, if we consider climate models like the CMIP models, obviously those models do not represent the mesoscale organization of shallow convection, so they cannot help us very much on this. We can consider other types of models like, like the cloud resolving models or the large eddy simulation models. But even in those models, uh, representing the different patterns of organization can remain a challenge for different reasons. And to un appreciate the challenge, uh, I'm showing you here this, uh, this satellite picture again on a scale of a few thousand kilometers here that shows you that 
at this scale, you can really find many different types of patterns. Uh, sugar here, um, gravel here, uh, some flowers, and here some fish. And those patterns are associated with different space scales. So if you have a very high resolution model that can represent mesoscale organization on some scales, if you want to, re to, to look at the sugar type of, of clouds or, or maybe even the gravel, then it's okay if you have a, a small domain for your model. But if you want to study the, the fish type of organization of flowers, and then you need a much larger domain. And at the moment, most of the cloud feedback studies uh, for low clouds, which has been uh, done for using this type of uh, explicit models, uh, as I've been using very small domains, uh, either very, very small domains, sometimes even smaller than that, where you don't have any organization or, or really a, a very small scale organizations, or you have a larger domain like 50 kilometers, sometimes 100 kilometers, where you start having some organization like cool pools, for instance. But, uh, but with, with this type of domains, you cannot get uh, fish or flowers, for instance. You need a, an even larger domain. <clears throat> but at least we can look at what has been learned uh, about the role of the mesoscale organization of clouds in the low cloud feedbacks with this type of domains. Keeping, keeping in mind that it's only, it considers only the role of some particular types of organizations, not the, the, the biggest line, ones. So for instance, in this study by Rafaela Fogger, uh, she used a large dissimulation uh, model in, uh, with and without special organization of shallow convection. And she did this by using different domain sizes for the simulations. And what she showed is that depending on whether she was running on this the size of, of the main or, or on this one, she got very different uh, cloud fraction profiles. So at first order, the macroscopic properties of the cloud field really were uh, strongly uh, different, very different depending on whether or not uh, there was some organization uh, on the large domain or, or not. And then she also made experiments in which she uh, imposed a 4K warming at the surface. And she found that in all, in all cases, uh, the, the cloudiness slightly decreased. And the response was much uh, smaller in the case of the large domain than in the case of the small domain. So what it shows at least is that there is a potential for the mesoscale organization of clouds to affect the response of clouds to warming. But obviously, yeah, those results remain quite uncertain because, as I said, again, uh, the simulations represent just some particular types of organizations. But at least it says that the, the, can, the organization can really have a huge influence on the macroscopic properties of clouds and their response to climate change. So if we want to consider more types of mesoscale organization, then we need larger domains. And, Ideally, we'd like to have global simulations with a very fine simulation, very fine resolution so that we can represent this uh, different organizations. And at the moment, we're, well, we're starting to, to see the emergence of this uh, very high global resolution models. Like uh, here, I'm showing you a snapshot from the ICON model developed at MPI, which is a global 2.5 kilometer uh, model. And at this, so it's a very short uh, simulation and it's not a climate change simulation, <laughs> not yet. But you see that in those simulations at high resolution, the model spontaneously uh, simulates something that is reminiscent of what we can see in observations through this type of fish or flower patterns, for instance. So that's encouraging and, and says so that probably you will learn a lot about this, uh, uh, these patterns and their role in climate with this uh, new types of models. But at the same time, a resolution of 2.5 kilometers is, is a little bit coarse if you want to represent really the, the shallow cumulus processes, because the, the, the typical size of shallow clouds can be much smaller than that. So it's, uh, it's, it raises other problems. So it's, even for those models, it's, it will be very important to understand uh, how realistic the shallow clouds are in these models, how they interact with the environment, and whether they, and then ultimately we hope to, 
to learn something about the role of cloud feedbacks in cloud feedbacks. And the reason why we are really interested in, in knowing how these clouds might respond to, to global warming is because, as you might know, the, the trade wind clouds are suspected to play an important role in climate sensitivity. Um, well, they can play an important role by being very sensitive to warming or by not being very sensitive by, uh, to warming because the trade wind clouds are actually the, the correspond to the, to the most uh, prominent type cloud type on Earth. So depending on how they will respond to warming, they will influence the climate sensitivity a lot. Even if they don't respond to warming, that will be a very big constraint on climate sensitivity to know it. And at the moment, uh, the CMIP models, uh, as you know, uh, exhibit very, a wide range of climate sensitivities. And, with, um, and between the low sensitivity and the high sensitivity models, what has been shown is that the difference comes to a large extent to the response of clouds in the trade wind regimes especially uh, in the response of clouds at cloud base. So that was one of the strong motivations for organizing uh, this field campaign, that uh, the Eureka field campaign, because we really want to understand what controls the cloudiness uh, in the trade wind regions. And another question now that we, we'd like to, to address is whether the lack of representation of mesoscale organization in these models can be an issue for for the, the trade cumulus cloud feedbacks simulated by those models. So for all those reasons, uh, we are very much interested in the trade wind clouds, how they interact with the, their environment. And that's why we organized the Euric Acid campaign with Bjorn and David Farrell from Barbados. So there are several overview papers presenting the campaign. Uh, one that was written before the campaign, presenting the motivations and the, the experimental strategy for the campaign. Another one presenting what we actually did during the campaign that is, uh, has just been accepted for publication. So you can look at these papers if you want to know uh, more about it. But so I will present you a, a few main things about the campaign first. Uh, so the campaign took place near Barbados here. And uh, Barbados is really a, a great place to, to study trade wind clouds because it's here. Uh, so it's the train winds are off, uh, blowing like that. And so the, the clouds that arrive in Barbados are really uh, have not been affected by any land mass or over thousands of kilometers. So it's really very much like being in the middle of the ocean and looking at clouds. So it's a great place to, to observe clouds. And in addition, um, what has been shown a few years ago in this study by Brian Medeiros and Louis Nyans is that uh, the clouds at Barbados uh, are representative of the clouds of the trade wind regions, both in observations and in climate models. So it's a nice place to, to study this type of cloud. So this is uh, where Eureka took place. Uh, Barbados is here. And most of the, of the operations took place uh, east of Barbados within this circle here, and also along a transect, more or less a line with uh, uh, the trade winds. But um, and initially, the, the Eureka field campaign was meant to focus on cloud processes and their interaction with the boundary layer and so on. But as we were preparing the campaign, actually many other uh, groups and, and scientists found that it was a great opportunity to address complementary uh, questions. And so there, there were uh, also initiatives focusing on, on characterizing the Earth interactions in this region and uh, also the, 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 the impact of uh, ocean eddies and ocean uh, meso mesoscale structures in the, uh, on, on the impact that they could uh, have on the air sea interaction. So the, and, and the studies um, developed in particular in, the, in this branch here, so south of Barbados, where we, there are big ocean eddies. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about in, in the next uh, few minutes we will be mostly uh, based on what we've, we've done within this area here, east of Barbados. So initially the campaign was meant to, 
to use uh, observations from two research aircraft, ALO from Germany and the ATR-42 from, from France. And there's all uh, observations from the Barbados Cloud Observatory. But because the scope uh, of the campaign uh, increases, increased a lot, uh, at the end, we had many more uh, observing systems, and that was great. Uh, we had four research aircraft. Uh, we had four research vessels participating. We had a big radar uh, installed on Barbados, especially for the campaign to measure pre precipitation. And we also had a lot of autonomous observing systems to characterize either the ocean or the atmosphere or the, the ocean surface to study the, the air-sea interaction. And many of the systems actually were very new and some of them were used for the first time. And uh, it was really uh, something special for, for this campaign. You have so many uh, types of observing systems. So based on this, we have a very rich ensemble of observations uh, for the atmosphere, for the upper ocean, for the ocean surface. And, and we can really uh, characterize the atmosphere and the ocean on, on a wide range of scales. So, <clears throat> If I come back to the, what we really wanted to do in terms of, uh, of, of cloud processes initially for this, during this, this campaign, uh, we, we designed the strategy of the Eureka Field campaign around this at the beginning. It was really based on the, on the use of these two aircraft. The, the German aircraft, ALO, was uh, flying large circles in the upper troposphere at about nine kilometer height. And uh, on, on board the aircraft, there was a rich uh, um, instrumentation for remote sensing to, to observe clouds from above in different ways. And also the, the aircraft had the ability to drop, drop zones along the circle so that we could really characterize the environment in which the clouds occur. And at the same time that HALO was flying these large circles in the upper troposphere, the French uh, aircraft, uh, the ATR, but also uh, the British uh, aircraft, the uh, twin rotor, were flying in the lower troposphere. And uh, with the ATR in particular, we, we focused mostly at, at the cloud base level, but also in the subcloud layer to observe clouds from, from uh, below or within clouds. So one of the key measurements that we, we did during Eureka was measuring the divergence of the large-scale vertical motion. That's because we know that there's, uh, uh, the, the large-scale vertical motion is very important in controlling the, 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 the cloud field. And a few years ago with Bjorn, we had shown that we could measure the large-scale divergence uh, by using drop zones. So if, if an aircraft is flying a large circle like that, and if we dropped uh, many zones, zones along the way, then each zone measures vertical profile of the horizontal wind. And by looking, by, by using all the drop zones along the circle, we can compute the, the divergence of the horizontal wind. So the, the divergence and, and by integrating upward, we can infer the, the large scale vertical motion. So the size of this circle was about 200 kilometers. So what we measure is the large scale vertical motion at what, at the, well, what we can still characterize as being the mesoscale. The mesoscale. So we, we did that a lot during Eureka. Um, there were three uh, circles uh, in the first half of the day and three circles again in the second half of the day, each with uh, 12 drop zones dropped uh, for each circle. So many drop zones every day. And based on, on this, we can really look at the vertical uh, structure of the divergence and the vertical motion as a function of height and as, vertical of, and as a function of time. As you can see, there is a very rich structure in the profile of, uh, of mass divergence. And by comparing the, the measurements on one day to the next, we could see that there, there is also a, a lot of variability really of, uh, of the divergence and the vertical motion. So if we look at the large scale vertical motion, uh, if we average all the measurements over, the, over a month, over the, the whole campaign, we see that above the boundary layer, the vertical motion is, uh, is subsiding and fairly small, and that what balances the first scale relative cooling. That's an order of magnitude that we expect. 
But if you compare this with uh, the measurements that we can get on uh, one particular day at one particular moment of the day, you see that the, the order of magnitude is very different. And really the, the vertical motion was extremely variable. And even in the boundary layer, we, we could have some uh, subsidence, but we could have some large scale ascending motion as well in, in the boundary layer that was quite common. Another key measurement um, in Eureka was uh, the estimate of the mass flux at cloud base. And there are different ways um, through which the mass flux can be estimated. But one, uh, one way that we wanted to, to use in Eureka was to estimate the, the mass flux through a mass budget of the subcloud layer. So if you write uh, the equation for the height of the, of the, of the mixed layer, which is a uh, the layer here. Um, so the, the time der derivative of the height of this mixed layer depends on the magnitude of the large scale vertical motion. If you have subsidence, it pushes uh, the mixed layer downward. It also depends on the entrainment at the top of the mixed layer. That depends on, uh, on the turbulence at the top of the mixed layer. And it depends on the mass flux uh, at the cloud base that exports mass out of the subcloud layer. So if we measure the depth of the mixed layer, we measure the large scale vertical motion, as I explained just before, using drop zones. And we estimate the entrainment from the surface uh, fluxes, turbulent fluxes under the other vertical, uh, the jumps in temperature and humidity at the top of the mixed layer. Then we can estimate the mass flux as a residual. And Rafaela Fogel has shown that this methodology could work while well, she did that using uh, large, uh, by analyzing LES simulations. But then she applied the same methodology to the Eureka uh, observations. That's what she, she's doing it at, at the moment. And here I'm showing you um, a time uh, evolution of the, of the mass flux that was measured during the whole campaign. And as you can see, there is a lot of variability of the mass flux both on day-to-day uh, -day variability, but also within a given day, there is also a large uh, diurnal variability of the mass flux. Then we, another key measurement was the cloud-based cloud fraction, partly for the reasons that I explained earlier, the fact that we want to really to understand what controls the cloud-based cloud fraction for cloud feedback studies. And, and to, to do this, we propose, well, we can, measure the cloud fraction in different ways again, but in the, in the trades, the cloud fraction is very small, just a few percent. So we need a lot of sampling to get accurate measurements. And so for this, for this reason, we propose to measure the cloud fraction through horizontal LIDAR and radar measurements. So by using a, a LIDAR or radar looking through the windows of the aircraft of the ATR, and uh, by using the LiDAR radar synergy, we could detect the presence of clouds. And finally, another key measurement for the campaign was the radiative cooling, because we know that in these regions, there are many processes which depend on radiation, for instance, the circulation, uh, that some mesoscale circulation can be driven by, uh, by the radiants in radiative cooling in those regions. So what uh, Analia Albright and, and a few colleagues have done is that they used all the soundings uh, of the campaign coming either from radio sounds or from, from drop sounds. And there were many of them, as you can see. Uh, and for each sounding, they computed a vertical profile of radiative cooling in clear sky so that we have uh, this great data set now. Finally, in terms of mesoscale organization, during Eureka, we, we were lucky enough to sample a large diversity of cloud types and, and, and cloud patterns. So on this day, for instance, we had something like a fish type, fish pattern. Here we had something like flowers, like here we had a gravel. And on these days we had, well, we don't see the clouds on, on these images, but we had mostly sugar clouds. So we, 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 we could sample the different types of uh, organization. That was nice. So if you want to, to remember something from Eureka, um, actually it was really a, a campaign during which we were able to characterize the clouds and the environment of clouds on a very wide range of scales and through many, many different types of measurements. Um, 
So we could characterize the mesoscale or the large scale through satellite observations, through radar measurements. We could measure, uh, characterize a very macroscopical scale. For instance, some people were looking at the individual cloud droplets and how they aggregate from rain, for instance, within clouds. There were many radars looking uh, from the top, looking sideways or upward or whatnot. And there were high resolution uh, radiometers to look at clouds with a very, very good uh, resolution. And there were macrophysical measurements within clouds as well, measuring the cloud water content, vertical velocity, and so on. And in addition to that, for the environment, we had measurements of the large scale vertical motion. We had measurements of the surface, of the surface fluxes, and much more. So it really, uh, we have a very large data set now that, that can be used for a wide range of process studies if you're interested in clouds and, and their interaction with the environment. So now I, um, I hope, I don't know how I am in time, but I'm going to, um, to give you a few uh, first insights from the campaign. Uh, so one first lesson from the campaign that was very clear is that uh, shallow convection generates a lot of cold pools and we, see, we saw many of them during the campaign. Um, you see this, uh, by, by, um, this arcs here that develop ar around uh, this uh, deep clouds here. Well, deep, they go up to a few kilometers only, but uh, you really see this cold pool. So it's not only in regimes of deep convection that we can find cold pools, but also in, in regimes of shallow convection, they are very common. You can see them also very clearly uh, from aircraft uh, pictures. And there's a uh, cold pools can be uh, very well detected from the soundings. So it's not only by looking at the horizontal heterogeneity of temperature and humidity that you can detect them, but also by looking at the sounding because they are associated with a very shallow mixed layer. And so some people um, like uh, Ludovic Tuse paper uh, characterize the cold pools during Eureka and, and they showed that they were colder than the environment, a bit moister than the environment and windier. And of course, um, the cold pools were only one type of organization that we observed. And, and we, as I said earlier, we really observed a, a large range of organizations. And what we, we are very much interested in, in in my group is trying to understand what, uh, how, what controls those different patterns of organization. And in particular, we know that in the trades, the cloudiness is strongly related to what's going on in the subcloud layer in particular the presence of thermals or coherent uh, circulations. So we really wanted to, to characterize this connection. And we did this mostly by using data from the ATR and from the drop zones. So on board the ATR, we had turbulence measurements. Uh, we could measure temperature, humidity, and, and winds at uh, 25 Hertz, which uh, because we were flying at about 100 meters per second, it's gives us a special uh, resolution of about four meters, so very high resolution. And um, based on these fluctuations, we could detect the presence of, of boundary layer thermals. So we can count them. We can also uh, characterize the size of the thermals. So over, over Eureka, on average, we found uh, that we had a mean density of thermals of about one thermal every kilometer. And we found that 20 to 30% of the thermals were capped by a cloud. Also, um, with the horizontal LIDAR and radar measurements, we could characterize a cloud field within the rectangle around which uh, the ATR was flying and uh, develop a cloud mask with a resolution of 25 meters. And based on this, we can compute the cloud base cloud fraction. So it's a small number on average about four or five percent. Uh, but what's interesting is that, first of all, we well, the, the, the estimate of the cloud-based cloud fraction is fairly consistent while it's still preliminary uh, analysis and data, but uh, at first order, it's fairly uh, consistent among the different uh, measurements that we had on board the aircraft from remote sensing or from in-situ uh, observations. And what's interesting is that the cloud-based cloud fraction, as you can see, uh, varies a lot from one day to the next. 
uh, which was a bit different from what had been suggested before the campaign, where people thought that it would be a more or less constant. So here we see some, some uh, variations. And um, because we expect the cloud-based concentration to be related to the presence of thermals, we looked at whether there were there was some relationship between the variations of the cloud-based concentration and the density of cloudy thermals. So this was um, derived either from lidar radar measurements or from uh, in situ measurements, and that was derived from the turbulence measurements on board the aircraft. And we do find a close connection between the two. So if we want to interpret the, the variations of the cloud-based cloud fraction, then we have to look at what can modulate the density of cloudy thermals. And we looked at different um, environmental conditions that could uh, affect this. And we found at least, uh, well, it's, it's really ongoing work, huh? but we found at least two, um, two properties of the environment that seem to be important for the modulating the density of cloudy thermals, in particular, the strength of the mesoscale vertical velocity in the lower troposphere and the surface wind speed. And the flights during which we had the more, the uh, many thermals were associated with strong wind speed conditions and, and large scale ascent in the boundary layer. But now if we're looking at the link with the mesoscale organization, uh, at first we can be a little bit disappointed because if uh, here I, I, I featured two, three different days, three different flights that were clearly associated with different cloud types and different patterns of cloudiness. And yet if you, you look at the cloud-based cloud fraction, they are more or less the same at cloud-based. So it seems that the mesoscale organization at, at first order is not imprinted in the cloud-based cloud fraction. However, if we look, instead of looking at the total cloud fraction at cloud-based, we look at the individual clouds and we look at the size distribution of individual clouds, then it's very different. <clears throat> Here I'm showing the size distribution of the cloud-based uh, cloud bases. And in this case, when we had mostly sugar clouds, we have only uh, very small clouds, cloud bases. Well, in those cases, we have many cases of very small uh, cloud bases, but there's also a smaller number of much larger cloud bases. So we looked at this more systematically for every flight of the campaign. And we, we found that really the size distribution uh, can really be uh, inter interpreted as a mixture of two populations of clouds. One population which corresponds to many clouds of very small size, and another population associated with smaller, uh, fewer clouds, but much larger cloud bases. So we, we found that we could fit the size distribution with a mixed exponential function. So two exponentials, each exponential representing one cloud population or one mode of the cloud population. And each, uh, each mode being characterized by two parameters. One is a fraction of the population that this mode represents. And the other parameter being the, 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 the length scale of this mode, which corresponds to the mean size of the, of the cloud, cloud population in this mode. So we did this for every flight. And this is the first mode for the different flights. So on average, um, the, the length scale for this mode is, is, is quite small. It's about 100 meters on average. So it's what we, we infer from the LiDAR radar measurements. And actually, it's interesting that the, if we look at the size distribution of the cloudy thermals that we can infer from the turbulence data, in situ data, then we find that the mean size of the cloud thermals is also about 100 meters. So the way we interpret this first mode is that it corresponds to the clouds that cap individual thermals. And that's why we have so many and they're associated with small cloud sizes. But there is a second mode and this, the length scale of this second mode is very variable from one day to the next, as you can see here, the length scale can vary from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers. What we found is that this um, second mode, the length scale of the second mode is very much related to the presence of, of rain. So when we have a large cloud basis is when we have a lot of precipitation. 
And the way we can interpret this relationship is the fact that when we have a large cloud base, then the clouds are associated with a weaker um, uh, entrainment, and therefore the clouds can go deeper and can generate precipitation more easily. And what's interesting is that there seems also to be some uh, connection or relationship between the size of the cloud bases and the, mesos the different cloud types, types that compose the mesoscale patterns of cloudiness. For instance, on this flight, here yeah, we had a sugar type of situation, so very small clouds. We had a single mode of a single cloud population associated with very small clouds. And in this case, we had a larger cloud bases. And then we have a superposition of small clouds, but also a few deeper clouds. And when we have even larger cloud bases, then it's when we start having rain and, and even deeper clouds and, and the formation of stratiform cloudiness near the inversion level. So it seems that the size distribution of cloud bases uh, might be important to understand how we, we go from one type of cloud types to another and understand the, the emergence of these different patterns of cloudiness. So then the next question is what controls the size of the cloud base? As we've seen, the typical size of thermals is about 100 meters or a few at maximum a few hundred meters. So the, the large cloud bases of a few kilometers are much wider than this, which suggests that they might be associated with an aggregation of thermals. But then the next question is, why do we have such an aggregation of thermals? Uh, so it could be related to, to the surface heterogeneities potentially, or it can be related to internal uh, organization within the, the subcloud layer. So we're starting to started to look at this using the turbulence data set. Again, it's very much work in progress, but you, you're looking at the spectrum of vertical velocity within the subcloud layer, for instance, we find that there are typical or characteristic length scales, which most of the time are, are of the order of one kilometer, which is consistent with the mean density of thermals that we found that was, uh, we have about one thermal every kilometer in these regions. But sometimes we have also characteristic uh, length scales, which are much larger than that. And so now the, the question is what, what how to interpret this and and this is yeah really work in progress so i will conclude now because i think i've been a bit too long uh, but as i am I, I hope i have convinced you that uh, well, the shallow clouds can really organize in many different ways and the organization that we can find in the trade wind regions is really interesting because it can be very diverse uh, this organization is associated with different types of, of clouds and, um, and those different organizations depend on the environmental conditions and, uh, and they, can, uh, they have different relative impacts so that they, they could play a role potentially in cloud feedbacks also we are not sure about it yet. Thanks to Eureka we can start uh, trying to uh, understand what controls these different patterns of organization. And our first analysis suggests that the organization of shallow convection is imprinted in the size distribution of clouds at cloud base, that shallow rain mostly forms from clustering, and that the large cloud bases are associated potentially with uh, a coherent mesoscale organizations in the subcloud layer. But it's, uh, yeah, it's really a work in progress, the very preliminary findings, and uh, we hope to test this hypothesis further in the future. So thank you very much. Thank That's you very much, Sandrine. Sharing maybe. Up. Yeah, so that I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, you were saying about the advantages of the, the Zoom meeting. One of the disadvantages, though, is you can't hear everybody clapping at home. <laughs> I assure you there's rapturous applause echoing <laughs> around the internet. So I've got a couple of questions come in, and I've actually got one or two of my own. Uh, the first person actually I'm going to hand over to is Daniel and then to Simona. Let me just ask to unmute. Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, I clicked twice. Daniel, you should be able to speak now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Sandri. That, that was a great talk. Very, very interesting. 
Um, I just was wondering if yeah, you had if if you had the chance during Eureka to look at any aerosol impacts, in particular maybe the Saharan dust that probably has some strong impact there. So yes, so there were aerosol measurements, and as you might know, in Barbados is a great place to to measure aerosols, and uh, it's been historically a place with aerosol measurements, especially to to look at this aerosols coming from Africa. So there are several decades of measurements <laughs> uh, there. And uh, during Eureka, we did measure aerosols as well. And we had a few episodes of dust, indeed. Uh, a lot of dust coming from Africa. And apparently, according, I'm not a specialist of aerosols, but according to some colleagues, it seemed that in winter, usually, we don't have so, much, uh, so many intrusions. Uh, or, or arrival of dust aerosols from Africa, but uh, apparently with time we have more and more. We have this more and more often, even in winter. And we had a few episodes during uh, the campaign. So yeah, that can be a, an opportunity to look at uh, how they affect different things. Okay, okay. thank you. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> um, we also have a, a question of clarification from Enora. Um, so yeah, so um, as for the definition of the limits for the four groups, four types of clouds, I'm not sure I understood properly uh, how you defined the, the limits between them. Uh, so I remember that, that, that group where uh, uh, there was the, the ABCD groups and, uh, and this gray cross in the middle to separate them to make sure that the groups were far away. But how did you decide like, what's A and what's gray, what's nothing, as an example. Mm -hmm. So in our, in our classification of the organizations using satellite observations, we define those four groups of organizations in a very su super simple way. We just look, uh, consider the first and last deciles of each metric, right? So we didn't know a priori whether it was flowers, gravel, or anything else. We just wanted to distinguish contrasted types of organization. That's all. That just afterwards, that we looked at what type of patterns had been classified visually for these different uh, quadrants. And that's when we, we found out that one quadrant was uh, mostly corresponding to flower patterns and, and so on. But at first, we just wanted to, to distinguish different types of organization, not knowing whether it was flowers, sugar, or anything else. But 